Great. So we do have um, a response to both papers um, by um, Della Porta Donatello, who is a professor of political science and I believe still the dean of the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences in Florence. Um, I believe as well you have play a central role in the center of social movement studies and the study of social movements is your main uh, scholarly and, um, and public task. Um, your books include movement parties in times of austerity, really important. Where did the revolution go? Excellent title. And mobilizing for democracy, very exhilarating. Uh, so I will let you um, take over and uh, and please, um, uh, uh, um, I think af afterwards we will bring up the final panelists, we'll take some questions, we'll make some remarks, and then we will go for a drink or, or find a fountain. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, uh, invitation and apologies if I have to run away quite soon. What um, uh, I wanted to do in discussing uh, uh, this paper is uh, introducing indeed the perspective of social movement studies uh, and uh, addressing uh, more directly the issues of uh, social movements in and against uh, universities, especially student movements within the universities to address some of the issues uh, about uh, the, diff the ways in which different models of knowledge and uh, uh, different arrangements of higher educational system uh, affect the development of social movements because I agree very much with Achille uh, that we face a similar type of trends but with still a lot of diversities uh, even within Europe. We uh, at the Center on Social Movement Studies, we are doing two, two research which I think speaks directly to this topic. One is a comparative analysis of uh, the student movements in uh, Chile, Canada, Italy and the UK. And another one is a research with uh, Ilaria Pavan, who is sitting there, uh, on knowledge in social movements. So how uh, social movements uh, can be also considered as producing knowledge and in which sense they interact with other forms of knowledge uh, produced by other uh, actors. And I, I want to start with uh, a pictures which I think tell us uh, the ways in which challenges are also changing. Um, I was in these demonstrations, uh, the, there were hundreds of demonstrations, marches for science, uh, and there were demonstrations which addressed uh, some shift uh, in the hegemonic conceptions of, uh, of science, some shifts that maybe we had not even considered as possible because we considered that there was a respect for a neopositivist type of development of knowledge, but what we saw with Trump fake news and so on, was that as a, as a marchers uh, I met in Berlin at this protester says, I couldn't believe I had to, pro to protest and march to defend science. And, uh, and I took these pictures because indeed at this uh, 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 march I felt at the same time happy but also a bit puzzled. Uh, I was happy because there were many more people than uh, expected by the organizers and because I saw that there was uh, a very broad uh, type of support for, for the criticism uh, of uh, Trumpism and Trump's visions of uh, science and universities, that there was a very broad type of coalition of people calling and institutions calling for more money for uh, uh, science, uh, decommodifications of knowledge and so on. But at the same time, it was also done 
uh, with some type of framing that uh, um, it was not really my way of seeing science. So for instance, uh, what do we want evidence-based science? When do we want it after peer review? Was not really my vision of uh, uh, science and I think it is not uh, uh, the visions that social movements have defended in general. But they point at the uh, um, fact that we are living in a critical junctures, in a moment of changes, uh, in which I think there are um, challenges and opportunities for uh, rediscuss uh, issues of uh, science, knowledge, and so on, uh, taking into consideration the type of uh, um, developments that have been emerging and going on very quickly, even vis-a-vis -vis the neoliberal visions of uh, uh, science. So I think in, in these demonstrations, as in many, there were uh, very different point of views, and I think that this protest uh, also served as a basis uh, for rethinking and discussing uh, with people with whom uh, we could share some part of the criticism of Trumpism, but uh, develop different type of visions uh, and uh, discuss indeed what knowledge is uh, and uh, how different forms of knowledge uh, could interact uh, and uh, how one could um, uh, arrive maybe at shared framing on these uh, uh, issues. So, uh, I appreciated a lot both presentations that tended to present the alternative uh, visions of knowledge that uh, should be at the basis of uh, uh, student protest, uh, uh, academic protest, and conceptions of uh, uh, um, education in uh, uh, nowadays societies. But uh, taking the perspective of uh, uh, social movement studies, I want also to focus on what movements have done uh, and could do uh, when opposing this type of uh, uh, universities. And research on the student movements had in general pointed at the fact that uh, student movements have changed uh, according uh, and following uh, uh, different uh, transformations in the way in which higher education has been uh, considered in different uh, uh, type of systems and within the same systems at the core, at the periphery, at the semi-periphery and so on to use the language of the world system type of uh, approach. So education has been given different and shifting type uh, of meanings, and uh, Achille pointed at this both in the, in the pres oral presentation and in the written paper when he said uh, it is uh, uh, what we have, uh, a complex system which develops from colonialism but also from attempt to decolonize and uh, uh, from also integrating uh, the type of um, um, say, victories that student movements of the past had uh, in different uh, uh, ways, in different type of uh, systems. And what we saw, in fact, in our research, and this, I think, is something which could be useful uh, to put in a comparative perspective also with other continents, which were represented in the two uh, papers presented today, is that uh, in the evolutions of the higher education system, there are many similarities but there are also still varieties. Uh, uh, diversities of capitalism is reflected also still in different uh, uh, type of models and that this represents different uh, uh, opportunities and constraints for struggling uh, uh, against uh, the uh, hegemonic models. Also, what social movement studies uh, uh, have stressed a lot looking at the student movements is that students' movement have always been located, um, rooted uh, within other types of uh, uh, forms of protest. So for uh, the, the 68 generations, but even before uh, in the United States, anti-war protest and uh, civil rights protest were uh, entrenched in the ways in which the 
uh, student movements developed at the end of the 60s. And so it happens also later on. And I think that when we think about the student movement today that are very lively in countries like South Africa, for instance, uh, we have also to locate them within this uh, broader type of uh, um, cycles of protest, is the terms that we use in social movement studies, convergences of different type of uh, 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 movements and the ways in which they, they interact nowadays and in the past. So we know, for instance, that many fields of studies, among which queer studies, uh, have developed on the basis of pressures by social movements. And these are also um, uh, sub-institutions which are still uh, uh, alive and kicking within uh, universities. And then I think also another consideration, which is uh, uh, something that uh, was mentioned especially in Achilles' paper, uh, but which emerged also uh, in the papers on India, is the fact that the student protests, which are so relevant for what we are looking at, also developed with specific type of um, uh, generational characteristics. So the type of generational culture, the type of uh, uh, generational um, uh, uh, characteristics in terms of uh, uh, using um, knowledge, producing knowledge, is something that Achille stressed in his uh, written paper when talking also about the ways in which new technologies tend to affect uh, the type of uh, knowledge uh, development. And I think another research which is going on, uh, uh, which I think is relevant uh, to address these issues, is uh, research on the new generations, on these millennials' generations, which uh, apparently could be so, say, progressive at some moments, but could also be so fed up with institutional politics uh, and, uh, and the institutions in general uh, that uh, tend to withdraw from politics at times. So uh, I the both presentation focused uh, on, uh, um, especially on one issue, which is indeed traditionally uh, one uh, of the claim, claims or set belongs to the set of claims uh, which are widespread in the student movements. But uh, I think these, these are usually uh, interlinked also with other types of uh, issues. So in, in our research, we singled out four sets of claims, uh, university fundings, which you also, uh, Achille also mentioned, fees, uh, uh, the, the fund, fund, external fundings, public investment, grants, loans, forms of distributions, uh, uh, excellence uh, type of projects, and so on. Um, the type of knowledge, which is the one uh, on which uh, uh, both uh, uh, presentations told a lot, and I think in this sense, it would be interesting also to uh, see how hegemonic knowledge is uh, conceived, uh, maybe with similar type of critiques, but with different labels. So some of the uh, critique of the European colonialism is something that developed uh, uh, in the European student movements as critique of the American type of uh, uh, hegemonic thinking in terms of neo-positivism and so on. So I think that some uh, type of um, um, critique of uh, the type of knowledge which is spread uh, in the universities has been um, quite central for student protest uh, all, uh, all over the history of the student movements, but with, of course, changing uh, targets uh, depending on the changes uh, in, in the environment. And the issues of uh, curriculum, epistemology, methodology, uh, pedagogy that uh, have been addressed nowadays, fragmentations, dominations of some type of thinking are uh, also present in different ways in the different student protests. And I think that it is interesting to see the balances between the uh, different ones. Um, another issue which has been addressed in both presentations and which I think that uh, becomes more and more relevant uh, uh, also in Europe, also in the movements that we are studying, is the issues of power distributions. When, when we studied the student movements in these four countries, we saw that there is 
uh, strong differences still in the management of the universities between a model driven by managerial type of leadership and uh, the traditional model of uh, um, academic governance. Uh, and uh, both are in transformations, but uh, 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 differences remain. And so this means also they produce different uh, opportunities and constraints for different movements. The representation of the students, the degree of recognitions of uh, channels of access to the universities, as well as the form of organizations of the students have, are also important. And I think that in a comparative perspective, uh, it is also um, important to see what remained, what was uh, the legacy of previous movements which had different characteristics in different countries and what is the legacy nowadays. And what we saw also is another set of um, uh, protests, think about LSE or uh, um, the, free, the University of Amsterdam recently, European University Institute, other protests about the forms of uh, the labor conditions. So uh, the outsourcing, uh, the precarizations of labor within the academia and outside of the academia, uh, the uh, lack of plurality, the debate about clientelism, uh, meritocracy, and so on, I think are all issues which is uh, uh, important to address in a comparative perspective in order to understand uh, um, challenges and opportunities for, uh, for movements. I think that uh, what we saw uh, in recent time, locating uh, this uh, uh, protest and the critical tasks, uh, or addressing the critical tasks of the universities, uh, is the fact that the student protest and the type of um, um, concerns about the universities are also embedded in uh, uh, some specific time and conception of time. So these are movements uh, which have developed, the one we have been looking at and the one uh, you have been talking about, in times of crisis, of late neoliberalism, of crisis of neoliberalism, with the protests which have been uh, uh, driven especially by the perception of the, th the threat. So this is something that Achille mentioned in his presentation. Uh, it is uh, from uh, uh, the uh, perceptions of how unbearable the development uh, of uh, the, the university system is that protest developed. And uh, it developed in a way that was not considered as possible by social movement studies, which tended to consider protest as um, deriving especially from uh, opportunities in terms of political opportunities, uh, resources, and so on. But it was, uh, uh, as, uh, as you were saying before, the shift uh, from a system in which uh, uni university knowledge uh, uh, was considered as a right, uh, even if it could have been also for nationalist type of uh, uh, program, into a system in which university is uh, a, a, a commodity, knowledge is a commodity. And here, I think the reactions by the student movements are important, and what we saw is that they've been different. So this is why in um, my uh, comments now, what I hope to uh, develop is a uh, comparative perspective about uh, where m uh, student movements go. Uh, and movements are, in this sense, more and more produced producers of their own uh, resources. So they react uh, and uh, in a way they produce knowledge themselves uh, uh, which uh, uh, should be um, available and used. And uh, uh, another. Are there only two slides, two comments I wanted to make. Uh, one is uh, how, how to analyze these uh, student movements in the different countries, which are ma some main dimensions. Uh, 
what we saw in our, in our research is that there are uh, different conditions in terms of the characteristics of the higher educational system uh, differentiated in, in uh, geographically and uh, uh, cross country, which produced uh, or um, uh, were reacted uh, against by social movements with different characteristics. So at both the organizational level and the level of uh, identity framing, the more symbolic level. I think at the level of the organizations, one of uh, the important elements is uh, to which extent have been these movements available to produce convergency uh, between uh, the different uh, users, uh, uh, actors within the, the universities. So we saw, for instance, that uh, very important in the development of student movements in Italy, Canada, or Quebec, where some victories were also uh, achieved, uh, was the capacity uh, to create convergences between uh, students, uh, precarious uh, academic workers, uh, uh, academic from the 68 generations which are now inside uh, the system, that is uh, broadening uh, the range of uh, support. But this didn't happen always. And uh, in fact, if we see the type of um, um, results of uh, the uh, movements, social movements in and against the universities, they tend to change a lot according to these different capacities to create uh, alliances. Also, I think another element which is important is uh, uh, something which has been uh, discussed uh, a lot in both presentations, uh, local, national, and transnational type of uh, uh, developments. So in these movements, uh, uh, sometimes in the higher education, in the knowledge productions, there is uh, a, a production of nationalism, and there is, uh, it is a, a production of a different type of identities, but immediately a sort of um, transnational linkages, because also the interactions between uh, uh, colonialism, decolonialism, uh, recolonizations uh, uh, in different forms is, uh, speaks to this transnational nature of the, of the movement. And uh, also what we saw is a different type of, um, I say, cluster of actors within the uh, student movements, from the associations to the unions uh, to the more social movements uh, uh, type of organizations. Framing is also quite different in different contexts, re redistributions and recognitions, to, to talk in uh, uh, a language which has been spreading uh, in social movements, are different uh, views which uh, sometimes uh, in different movements uh, uh, take different type of uh, equilibrium. Uh, specializations of generation, generalizations of the frames also tend to uh, change. But in the last slide uh, and last uh, few minutes, what I think is also important to reflect upon is face to, these, to the challenges which has been described uh, in both the evolution, traditional evolutions of neoliberalism as uh, uh, um, knowledge uh, as commodity, but also in the new challenge of Trump and Trumpism uh, of uh, discharging any type of uh, knowledge uh, as useful uh, uh, for the society. I think that still there are some opportunities which have been used by the different movements within the universities. Some are endogenous to the higher, higher educational system, and I think some are also the ones that you pointed at in your papers. So uh, new generational type of activism with uh, new generations that are able to exploit uh, different type of channels and forms of knowledge development so, uh, available uh, also outside of the traditional channels. I think uh, um, 
more and more perceived need for uh, uh, interdisciplinary convergence that uh, uh, is um, um, resisting uh, uh, to the fragmentation of uh, the field in subfields that you were describing in the papers, uh, but also that developed grows uh, uh, upon uh, the perceptions that in order to address the big problems of the crisis, in order to understand neoliberalism, capitalism, or uh, colonialism, and so on, uh, fragmented type of knowledge is not useful, and you need uh, to return to open uh, dialogue within uh, disciplines and across disciplines. I think there has been also an um, emergent uh, epistemological pluralism, uh, a new method and stride, which uh, I think also in uh, uh, mainstream academic environment, uh, more and more openings towards uh, uh, in interactions between the different type of uh, methods and methodologies. And uh, as Achille pointed out in his paper, potentials of new technologies uh, that, uh, of course, uh, uh, are not the solutions for the problems, but uh, present also uh, different types of uh, opportunities. And I think, and I finish here, there are also uh, some conditions, uh, opportunities, which are uh, uh, emerging outside of uh, the higher educational system. Uh, one is uh, the development of uh, a broad cycle of protest. I was uh, a few days ago at a conference uh, round table with Beverly Silva, uh, who is studying uh, uh, conflicts uh, at the global level, the world system type of approach of Wallerstein and others. And what they saw in their data is that 2011 represented the beginning of a new cycle of protest. And that's, uh, this uh, seems to be one of the biggest. So, uh, I hope it is not wishful thinking, but what uh, data shows is that uh, uh, protests are spreading, uh, uh, that talk very much and are resonant with the type of uh, struggles within the universities. Uh, another type of um, uh, important uh, exogenous but also endogenous characteristics is the fact that uh, I think and also the two papers uh, presented this point, there is uh, uh, an accumulation uh, of uh, resources. So the struggles of the past uh, have been contrasted strongly uh, by uh, neoliberal reform, but at the same time they, they didn't totally win over uh, what was conquered in the past. Uh, departments uh, that uh, could be, can be considered as, uh, to a certain extent, the outcomes of previous struggles are still there. Uh, there is a higher level of access to the universities. There is a new generation which is more and more socialized into protest politics. Uh, and I think that these elements uh, are uh, also relevant in creating opportunities for uh, struggles within. And a very final point, uh, uh, since Judith also mentioned the uh, movement title of the book, Movement Parties in Times of uh, Austerity. Uh, I think debate about the political opportunities for these uh, movements have been very often uh, affected and distorted by a vision uh, of the last important events in hegemonic countries. So 2016-2017 seemed to be the most pessimistic type of years because of Trump victories uh, uh, in uh, uh, the United States, the Brexit in the UK, and so on. But my impression is that uh, um, if there are many other type of signals, uh, which instead point at the potential resurgence uh, of the left, uh, at least uh, in Europe, with uh, uh, new political parties uh, or transformations within the old political parties, uh, that uh, to a certain extent uh, represent defense of uh, uh, the old 
welfare state, of the old social mechanism of protections, but to a certain extent are also sort of anti-systemic movements that are able to present uh, sort of uh, uh, alternative. And, uh, uh, and so I think that keeping this in, into account could be helpful in order to um, reflect also about the opportunities for this movement to which I think this conference gave a, a great contribution. Thank great. you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to invite um, uh, Rosie Bredotti and Raphael Laudani to come up and join us, if you can. Um, Maybe, I think there's some extra chairs back here. Um, I'm going to propose that we, um, given the interests of time, that we just take um, two questions um, on each paper. I mean, obviously, Nevedita is not here, but maybe two remarks on Nevedita's paper. And then, um, uh, and then um, two, two brief questions for, uh, Ashil, and then, and then we will proceed directly towards the, the final panel and remarks. Um, uh, Debjani, do you want, you want to start with a comment? Yes. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to thank the panel, and Nevedita is not here, but Ashil, thank you. And um, uh, I, I just have a couple of um, comments. Um, I know Nivedita is not here for us to be able to have a conversation. Um, one uh, issue that I wanted to, I guess, share and bring to the, to the floor here is, you know, when the question of this Hindu fascist control of not just our politics but our knowledge systems, there's a paradox in, 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 in for us humanists to consider. That is, for all their avowal of our Hindu roots, going back to antiquity, one area of knowledge that has suffered the most since they have had any kind of power are languages and cultures that actually go to the root of what they understand to be Hindu culture. An example is Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. Sanskrit has, has declined phenomenally in India in these last five years. And it's not just the decline of languages like Sanskrit, but also the active persecution of scholars around the world who are Sanskritists. Sheldon Pollock, Wendy Doniger, they have been harassed by the Hindu fascist government for the last several years. Sheldon Pollock is regularly trolled. And my, my point uh, in bringing this up is, is this kind of paradox, because Ashil was talking about a planetary university, trying to imagine one. So while they do this on the one hand, they promote English aggressively. They're not against English. They promote English. But if instead of Nivedita, we had a scientist giving this paper about the state of the university in India, it would be a very different narrative for two reasons. Because um, uh, Modi's government has been one of the most ardent champions of the information technology revolution, which is uh, 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 even when BJP was not in power, in the states where BJP was in power, they, they, they generated these educational institutions that trained thousands and thousands of IT experts in India. So, so those training in those fields would have a very different narrative. And one of the paradoxes about thinking planetary here is that the Modi government has already um, um, gone to climate scientists in India after making the Pla Paris pledge, si signing of the Pla uh, Paris agreement, that look, we have set these targets. 2030, 2030 all cars will be electric by all coal-fired coal plants. They're already beginning to close down, unlike what Trump said, but they will, go, uh, they will be there for a while and not. And he has gone to researchers in May, Old Indian Institute of Technology, the major, major powerhouses, knowledge powerhouses in India, and said, we promote, we promote climate science actively. So here are these paradoxes that I would love for us to be able to take on board when we think of what we mean by a planetary hum, uh, university or system that, that can resist these kinds of, 
you know, uh, politics. Uh, mm -hmm. While reckoning with the fact that, yes, if India and China as these big economic powerhouses come on board with climate change, that will be phenomenal for the world. So that's just one, uh, and, and one, another very uh, small point, I don't want to take up too much time, sorry, Judith, but the, but the, the, the politics of life and human, that, that uh, you know, rethinking the human that, that Ashil raised, and just the comment here, um, I, I read a very interesting passage just this morning uh, with a scholar who studies new media, gamification, I've been writing a little on that, and you know, he had this very interesting point to make about the ontologies of the self. He says, you know, what's being we've been seeing is there's a facetiousness about it. We are seeing a move from being to having hyperconsumption, having to appearing spectacle. Everyone wants to be seen visual, and in the new media age, appearing to net interacting interactivity. And there, there are and there are these fundamental shifts in the ontology ontologies of the self brought about not just by the human non-human. Uh, um, uh, spectrum, but also the deep, deep penetration of new media technologies and knowledge-making big engines, uh, which are, which are, you know, they they penetrate universities, but they are not owned by universities. And and uh, these are just a few comments that okay. I'd like to. Very good. Um, uh, may I ask uh, to whom you want to address your question back there? To Ashi, okay, um, okay. And do we have any? Do we have any other comment on Nevedita's paper before we move on? Yes, you, you have a. Okay, one right here. Yeah. Yes, um, it's not a question, but it's a more like a um, proposal, um, and it's related to the um, when uh, like we live in uh, countries with a uh, uh, fascist re regime. Uh, as, is, as it is the case of Turkey now. Um, and so <clears throat> what I wanted to ask is, uh, um, I don't know if you know the network of academicians for peace in Turkey. Of course. And they, um, right now they are doing like a meeting in Istanbul together with the People Health Movement, which is a movement of um, also like uh, people who are working in the university, but it's spread all over the world. And uh, they are doing this uh, meeting for supporting uh, the situation for people who are fighting against uh, Erdogan in Turkey. And what they're asking is uh, to have like concrete action of solidarity from other pe different and people and the univer other universities in the world. So I think uh, a proposal could be to for the Academy of uh, Global Humanities and Critical Thinking, and I think it's very related to the critical tasks of the university to write uh, a solidarity statement uh, for the Academician for Peace and people who, and professors who were fired uh, and cannot move and cannot go out from Turkey now uh, in solidarity with them. Okay. Thank you. We haven't yet moved into the Global Academy, although that happens in two days. But a, a, a good uh, request, and also that it may have already happened, but most of us actually up here are already um, not just signatories, but actively involved in that particular movement. But it's extremely important that you bring our attention to it. Thank you. Um, uh, brief, brief questions for Ashil. Um, yes, please. I just wanted to ask you about narratives. Um, zooming on these, on these crossroads you mentioned in rethinking the human. And you touched upon it when you, when you uh, mentioned about taking the planet seriously. But uh, if you could, exp I'm thinking also of Don Arroway's latest book, Staying with the Trouble. And uh, if you could say a little bit more about this crossroad in the light of your recent book, which is Politics of Enmity, which represents an idea that you also touched upon, that uh, restructuring and rethinking the human, thinking the structuring of the human bond, breaking the human bond. So if you, what are the narratives that we need today for some sort of positive critique or uh, reflective activism that, uh, 
you know, a master narrative if, or a plural narrative, but what do you think is, is the, the driving narrative that we need? Should we take one more question for Ashil? Do you hear me? <laughs> yes, uh, okay, so it's related to this former question and I wanted to, if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by this uh, notion of planetary university. To what extent is it different from, uh, let's say, a notion of a global or a cosmopolitan university? Mm -hmm. How is it, uh, is it opposed to a localized university, which was the second version that you also outlined? And also you were implying that there is a um, different notion of time uh, related to the planetary. So what do you, like, how, what do you mean specifically by this and how would it play itself out within a university context? You want to? Oh, sure. First of all, thank you for the, uh, the questions and, and, uh, and, and the comments. Um, let me, I mean, this won't be a, a specific answer to, to uh, what, what was raised, it's just a, a continuation of uh, uh, the reflection uh, I made and the way you, you understood it. It seems to me that part of what is going on in this very moment of ours is the, uh, the fact that various forces are, are coalescing to, to force, to oblige the human to confront both its own, uh, its own powers and uh, its own smallness its own powers and its own smallness, especially with, uh, with respect to other powers and forces of the universe that occupy us. I'm not sure that we have witnessed such a moment early on in our history. Or if we have, then we are witnessing an intensification of that uh, uh, remise en cause, that questioning. Which forces us to, to think in entirely different ways, if not our own smallness, at least our connections with the, um, the things that compose our world. Uh, this question of relation of which people like Glissant have written so much about uh, uh, early on. And uh, so things that compose our world, especially at these times when the world becomes more and more unlivable, at least for uh, many, many people. So, so the possibility is there to put forward the argument that in fact we are anything but these connections. I mean, if you want a driving idea, that would be it. We are anything, the human is anything but uh, our, our connections. Uh, the human is not an, a closed entity. Uh, it's entwined. Uh, in forces of becoming is part of intensities that unite us with, uh, with the natural world. That's really what I mean by the planetary. And um, I say this because, I mean, I mentioned a number of experimentations going on in all fields. I don't know what you read, but what, I, what I'm reading pushes me to believe that there is a renewed dialogue, for instance, 
that is in the making uh, between the social sciences, uh, the humanities, the studies of science and technology, uh, life and biological sciences, and philosophy. Um, when one reads a journal like Body and Society, it is absolutely clear. Theory, culture, and society, there are many outlets uh, in which the, these debates are, are going on. And they emphasize a number of things, and I'll end there. They have triggered the development of entirely new research agendas, uh, which privilege ideas of, I mentioned relationality, co-constitution, co-evolution, co-implication. The co is back with us. And the co is very different from the politics of enmity. I mean, what I say in the politics of enmity. The politics of enmity aims at precisely erasing the co. Uh, uh, it's a politics of non-relation. That non-relation becomes the mod modality of, of, of relating. Um, so, so the planetary is, I mean, I don't need to define it. It's uh, a manner of invocating a different kind of politics, politics of possibility that would precisely counter uh, what, what we, call, we call politics of enmity. But look, it's so hot, I think I should stop there. Uh, my, my, my brain is, is melting. <laughs> One more brief question for Ashil, and then we open it up. Who has a brief question? Okay. All right, let's, let's then move um, directly into um, our discussion. Um, and it seems to me that we have, oh, but Ashil, you, are you leaving us? He's running away. Run away, run away, strategic retreat. <laughs> you, you can be finished if you want to be, if you want to be. I, okay, I'm trying to make a seamless transition and you're running away. Okay. Um, no, seriously, you can go if you want. Oh, okay. All right. It is. It is. It is but you're, we've kept you on. Um, in any case, um, we have, I think, many. Um, we, we have very little time. I think uh, we we cannot offer a huge summary of everything that has happened here. Uh, but I do think. Okay. But I do think um, maybe uh, we can. Um, consider for a moment um, the importance of this notion of the planetary that Ashil introduces to us and um, think about uh, the ways in which it allows us um, to recontextualize differences of power, differences of vulnerability, as he has suggested, but also um, ways in which um, uh, uh, the earth climate change and our interconnected status as living beings um, decenters a certain um, anthropocentrism and um, and imposes a different kind of demand on thought and I suppose um, there are at least uh, sort of well there's one point to make here which is that um, marking and rendering visible differences of power or marking and rendering visible um, the, the differential schemes of identity um, take place against a background um, that we don't know how to describe. And it's not just that it's a theoretical inadequacy, but um, the problem of, of, of climate change or indeed um, the biopolitical and the necropolitical has entered the problem of life into all of these discussions in a way that has not been um, explicit for us in the last decades. Um, no, I would not want to abandon the idea of the social as an anthropocentric category because I think there are ways of thinking about the social precisely through the notion of interrelationality that takes us also past anthropocentrism. But I do think um, uh, we are being asked not only to understand the condition of possibility of these kinds of social analyses, but also um, we're asked um, 
what is it we are striving for? What is it um, that is imperative? What is it, uh, what kind of form of life, what kind of interconnected form of life is, is it that we are, um, we are after or that we require um, uh, for the future? And I, th I think there, that it's, it's a, there's an aspirational dimension uh, to this analysis that's well worth um, considering. I, I would like to hear, um, I, I'd just like to make one brief remark, which is we've talked about the university, but we haven't really talked at length about the presence of police and security personnel on campus and what the new, con new and old conditions of violence are um, under which university life now takes place. And I think this is true and true in a different way um, depending on where we are in the world, whether we're talking about public and private universities. But at least in some universities that are increasingly privatized or where the land and the buildings are treated as private property, um, police and security personnel are in fact um, defending the property rights of those who own the university and and what has happened is that the, the public character of the university, and that can be something that's true of private universities and public ones, but the public character of the university is eviscerated. So it's not just a question of neoliberalism and the kinds of metrics that are used to evaluate um, um, uh, knowledge and how some of our forms of knowledge have suffered under those metrics, um, it's also a question of how property rights, privatization, and, um, and the policing of the student body and the policing of dissent have also come together, very often producing authoritarian structures within the university and serving authoritarian structures within uh, the nation state. Uh, whether it's, um, and I, I just want to add that because I think we haven't really talked about authoritarianism. And the Turkish, the Turkish situation in which, as you know, um, educators at all levels, including university professors, um, signed a petition for peace which simply asked for the reinstitution of diplomatic discussions between the Turkish government and the Kurdish representatives. And um, and this was a process that that very government was already in the process of conducting, right? It broke it off. People signed a petition for peace and for the resumption of diplomatic efforts. And they are now accused of treason, of sedition, of terrorism. Um, more than 500 university professors have lost their jobs. Many more are threatened. And thousands of educators at various levels within higher education. It is true that... Um, it comes with censorship, right? No more dissertations on the Kurdish people. It comes with governing how geography is taught. It comes with the threats that against rectors of universities if they do not deliver threats against their own people. So there's a kind of violence that happens, I think, um, through the rising Bonapartism, the rising authoritarianism um, that is linked to security and police. It has, it has some links with neoliberalism. I, do, I agree with uh, Ashil, we cannot take neoliberalism as the only framework within which we describe these kinds of forms of power, right? But when we're living in a situation, and I'm, I'm thinking here as well, um, of um, what happens when uh, there is a public denunciation of state violence or state-assisted violence on a campus, and that denunciation is violently, is violently quashed or violently censored. I think universities, precisely because of their potential for student movements, are also the place where we see the, um, the assault on certain kinds of freedoms. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to stop there. I just want to make that point. I want to be able to say it. I think I see it in different ways in Turkey, in Mexico, in South Africa. Um, um, it, it's, it's very clear that the student movement in South Africa was very upset about the presence of, of, of security personnel on campus. It really opened up the question, what is this violence? How do we think about it? What is it against us? Who owns this university? Who belongs to this university? So. Um, that's all I'm going to say, and then I'm going to I'm going to turn 
um, to, um, I don't know, Rafael, do you want to go, go f next and then we, we will let the, let, we will have the brilliant Rosie do her thing? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Judith. Uh, I know it's late, it's hot, and you're here mostly to hear Judith, Roses, and, uh, and Achille, so I promise I'm going to be short. Uh, I just want to make a uh, few scattered remarks on these uh, three days of conferences we uh, have been participating, and uh, I want to start with a, a note of appreciation uh, it's uh, it's not kind of a formality. It's something I really I really believe. I think that during these three days, uh, all those people who have give us a presentation has taken very seriously the the, the job I've made. Uh, presentation I would say sincere presentation, putting on the table their own positions, open to. Uh, confront the position with uh, others. But I would say that even more, I, I, I was uh, positively uh, struck by the, the discussions uh, and the debates, precisely because it was mostly during this, uh, the, the, the discussions, the, the, the debates, that some crucial aspects and divergences and unresolved questions on the critical task of the university emerged. And, uh, and, and, and I think this was some way the main results of uh, our three days of uh, conferences. So, and underlining the, the, the crucial contribution of uh, debates, I repeat, it's not just for flattering the audience or uh, things like this, but uh, it is precisely because I think that during the debates, a series of also problems, I've resolved questions, uh, emerge. During these days, I've noticed a list of them. I just want to mention a couple of them, very general, that I think remain some kind of a legacy of a heritage of the conference to be discussed in future occasion. Uh, first of all, on, on the very notion of the university. Mm. We have been confronted with different uh, interpretation of what the university is, as an institution, diffuse university, different models. But I would say that behind the line in most of the uh, presentation, what was at the core of our discussion around the university was the fact that the university is under attack. Mm. Uh, but in a way, I would say, and I'm saying provocatively some way, that as if the university was not part of the overall process, okay? To use one of the categories that have been uh, used during this day, as if it was some way outside of the overall processes we are witnessing, you know, as I, we want to call it neoliberalism, capitalist globalization, or uh, whatever we want. Uh, however, and especially, I'm particularly glad that these things emerged, in, uh, to, especially today, during this morning panel and even uh, in the afternoon. Uh, I truly believe that, actually, we need, of course, the university is under attack. That's clear, what we, and then we, this has been uh, described eloquently in different papers. But at the same time, I think we have to stress the fact that this is internal of it. And the university, it's not a monolith. It's more a space, hmm? uh, a complex space. And at the same time, it's a space of implementation and stimulation, for instance, of neoliberal uh, politics, of uh, neo management, management policies. And it's at the same time a seat of critic and resistance. If we do not meet this complexity, some way, this double dimension of the university, I think that the risk that we some way reduce the critical task of the university today that we have been discussing, only that this, this critical task of the university can only take a defensive pattern. Mm? And this is again something that has been some way in the air during these three days. Of course, uh, the university has to be defended, this is clear, but I think it's not enough. 
And again, I think that some of these aspects have been uh, raised, uh, especially today. Uh, I think, on the contrary, that one of the critical tasks of the university today is some way to make a step forward this defensive pattern. Uh, in the critical analysis of uh, the situation of the university. Uh, some way assuming kind of an, a, a different approach, I would say kind of a subversive reappropriation of the ongoing processes. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that one of the main features and forces of capitalist globalization today is its capacity of uh, absorbing what it's emerging as radical and new and then subverted in a tools for the implementation of the logics of capitalist command. Uh, and I think that today critical theory and practice has some way to recover this capacity of absorbing and subverting, if you allow me the, the term, the enemy tools. Uh, the same is true also for the so-called humanities. Hmm? Uh, in most cases, I had the impression that when we were talking on the critical task of the university, on the critical dimension of the university, there was some kind of an immediate identification with the humanities, as if the humanities were the site in which this critical dimension of the university is concerned. Well, of course, this is true, but I'm particularly glad that at some point, especially, we started with a shield yesterday, and then uh, today we return on that. I think that we have to start thinking at the humanities on a broader sense. The university, it's, and also the critical dimension of the university, it's broader than the humanities in itself. And, uh, and also this division, this sharp division between the humanities and sciences and technologies, uh, they are historically determinate. Okay? And I think that, for instance, during uh, one-way presentation on the challenges and the historical transformation of the humanities in the Chinese uh, university, this emerged pretty well. There were a moment where the humanities were some kind of universal uh, science, where the differences between sciences and uh, humanities were not so sharply divided. And I think that this is not just the case of the Chinese experience. We can use it as a more general and broader uh, perspective. This also had to do on the changing role of the, of the humanities. I'm all, I, I was particularly interested in uh, what Wang Wei was saying in, in his presentation about the fact that today is the Chinese government hmm, is funding the humanities, uh, which is kind of a different pattern compared to other uh, university, but it was used as a soft power. Okay, so again, thinking on the fact that if we want really try to make a subversive of reappropriation of this uh, of the neoliberal uh, tools, then probably we have to also accept this idea: the fact that we can maybe take opportunity also of these tendencies and try to reinvert the direction. I want to just make an, an, uh, an example. It's probably a, a tricky example. Hmm? So I'm thinking of at, uh, during World War II, the war, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services of the United States, okay, the four, in some way the forerunners of the uh, CIA, that during the war built up the research and analysis branch. It was like where thousands of scholars were being some way involved in the war effort. And they were assuming all the, the European emigrants, very radical thinkers, and that they were oriented towards the goal of the war. Among those people, there were people like Herbert Marcuse, but I'm thinking also people like Paul Zwizzi and Paul Baran. And that was the very moment in which those people met together. Without the participation in that, specific experience, for instance, the monthly review would never emerge. So I would some way urge people to have the courage to dirty hands also with this, uh, the enemy. There are more opportunities that we can think about it without some way forgetting the fact that we have to defend uh, some aspects of 
uh, the existing and the past uh, and the past university. And with the same provocative goal, I want to make uh, just a final uh, remark on, uh, on critical theory. Hmm? In some way, we are here under the International Consortium Critical Theory Program, so it is also critical theory which is at stake here while we are discussing the critical tasks of the, uh, of the university. Uh, uh, I'm saying this very straight, straightforward, because I think that we, we have to. I have to be sincere, as all the people that have participating here uh, has been. Uh, the main limits that I found in during these debates is the fact that in the very moment where uh, some of divergences, uh, problematic aspects on the conferences emerge, in that very moment it has won some kind of a immediate tendencies to go back towards our, our own fields, our own backgrounds, our own paradigms, okay? We can talk about humanities, post-humanisms, or uh, the North, the South, we can make many examples. It, doesn't, it, it is not, for me, important to underline which one of these theoretical backgrounds we are, you know? So, some way we are all sharing we, we all feel part of a critical theory uh, project. There are many different critical theories approach uh, we share about, but I think that actually today one of the main urgency of critical theory is again to really open up and try to go beyond our known territory. And here again, of course, we all have our own background. I have my, my own background in critical theory, which is Herbert Marcuse and the Frankfurt School. And I think that actually one of the main legacy of Marcuse and the Frankfurt School, it's less in his analysis of in advanced industrial society, totalitarian, uh, totalitarianism, and so on and so forth, but it's precisely in a way of conceiving more broadly critical theory has a continuing re-examination of its own uh, basis. And I'm thinking particularly at the Marcuse debates with Adorno during the student movements in why, when the, the German student movements were occupying the Institute for Social Research, there is this now famous correspondence between the two, when Marcuse were affirming the fact that we have to be willing and have the courage to accept parricide if it's necessary. And in particular, thinking about the student movements that were fighting against their fathers, or we could say mothers, or, or, or what else. Well, I think this willingness to commit parricide is uh, one of the main uh, tasks of uh, a critical theory today. Uh, to say it with a, with a joke, I, I, would, I mean, I want to kill Marcuse, I want to kill uh, Foucault, I want to kill Derrida, I want to kill, if you uh, with a with due respect, I want to kill uh, Judith Butler, I want to kill Rosie Bredotti, Achille Mbembe, and I want to really open the way to transform what it's in most cases a slogan, the kind of hybridization between different perspectives to be a reality. If a new consortium of critical theory programs can go in that direction, uh, I think this consortium and critical theory could give uh, some kind of uh, help and support and tools for also for the critical task of the university. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. So when we dead awaken, I think it's very fitting that we are brain dead and totally hot. Uh, that the earth is telling us something and that if we really do want to ground the humanities in the real world, which is my argument as a posthumanist and a planetarist, well, it's going to get really hot. Um, uh, so that would be the preamble um, to a number of points because it's impossible to attempt any synoptic view, let alone synthesis, about a number of meeting points, uh, of course, read from my perspective. Um, minimum consensus after three days of boiling heat, there is a major mutation 
of the parameters of how we define the human, of how we understand what used to be a commonly shared humanity fraught with endless fractures and structural injustices, but even that minimum consensus has gone out the window, and consequently about what counts as the human in the humanities in a container we inherited from the 19th century called a university. Minimum consensus, something is up, major mutation. <laughs> On that, then three axes. Critique redux is the first one. The role of critique. I heard amazing, exciting um, uh, insights about where we go with this critique. Um, is the critical gesture the abduction of dominant ideas. Thank you, Sarah Natal. Is that the best we can do? Is it the seduction of theory in an allegedly post-theory era? Remember, theory is dead, said somebody, another zombie. Um, so it is a something about theory that even defeats the theory fatigue of our worn out times, the need to think adequately about our conditions. Is it the consolation of the intellectuals? And is that what we do critical work to? And what do we make of Stefano's and other people's remarks that capitalism loves critique, and that critical management studies is a really booming area, that people are putting the word critical in front of everything. My favorite being critical plant studies, studying plants. I love it. Um, uh, so it's a bit like the post of my youth. You stick critical in front of everything and all of a sudden it comes alive. Um, uh, we need maybe to go through all the recordings of the papers and highlight every time critical and critique comes up and maybe bracket it off and suspend it and ask ourselves when I say critical, can I replace it with something? What would it be? And I would always replace it with, of course, I'm a Deleuzean creative, make something of it and go beyond. Second axis, convergences, multiple. And I think we could redesign the last three days really like a website. First of all, convergences between different branches of technology, different branches of levels of knowledge production. And, uh, and I think I would offer modestly, but it may be contested, a minimum consensus that the universities have lost the monopoly of the production of knowledge, if we ever had it. Uh, that knowledge is being produced across the spectrum of the present civic, corporate, and online world. Um, it's called cognitive capitalism, biogenetic capitalism. We are all agents of knowledge in this capitalism, especially if we happen to teach in a university, no matter in which faculty. So convergence of different branches of technologies, in a sense a dispossession, a cognitive dispossession that Athena also talked about, of the university as a producer of knowledge and research. The essence of research today is privatized, it's outside, Public and private is not only corporate, it's not in the university. Convergence then of forces that contribute to displace the centrality of a dominant idea of the human, which I've always defined as a feminist, as a Deleuzean, as the human that was white, masculine, Eurocentric, heterosexual, urbanized, speaking a standard language, owning the women and the children, that idea of the human, man, him. I don't know who's going to miss it, but it's not going to be me. <laughs> um, uh, but you can see my anti-humanism. I'm a student of Deleuze and Foucault. I will not miss that man, not for one second, and I will not miss his woman either, <laughs> second sex included. Um, so the, but the displacement of that thing creates a cognitive panic because it hits at the core of whiteness, masculinity, and Eurocentrism. People who've been dispossessed and displaced forever, being the second and multiple other sexes, and being uh, indigenous, non-Western, non-people, being species that don't even count as human, those ones have not noticed that we have an anthropocenic crisis, let alone a displacement of the human. What else is new is what they're going to tell us. And the resurgence of interest not only in what used to be colonial, post-colonial, decolonial theory, but on indigenous knowledge systems, indigenous epistemologies, indigenous cosmologies, which was touched upon, but not, we didn't really go 
into it as much. I think that a revival of interest in that is really, really telling. And maybe learning from what used to be the South means learning from people who are really close to the earth. We are talking about earthing the humanities here, uh, grounding them. Hence, it's good that we are so very uh, hot. So do we agree, because this could be you know, a, a matter of dispute, that this is the convergence that we're in, um, that, that there, the, the, the convergence of displacement of dominance ideas of the human and multiple technology um, is, is forcing us to reconsider the material foundations for our practices. And here Terranova gave, I thought, a very interesting reading of the digitalization of our economy. And I think launched a very important uh, message that I do think the left, what's left of the left, do we still talk in those terms? The pro progressive political forces need to hear, are we reading our economic system adequately? Do we understand the new economy? Or do we still talk about the machine in the all mod modernist manner as this external other that is always a source of problem, that, is, that is, our, is the classical technophobia of the left still in our system? And what can we do to detox ourselves from it? Do we want to, <coughs> do we agree? I'm proposing this as one of those crossroads where we meet, we may agree on the diagnosis, but we need to take different roads from there on. And I would, um, of course, and I will plead my posthumanist cause, but I think there are multiple paths that we take, but do we agree that there is here a new digital artisan economy with a technological apparatus intimately connected to our embodied, embedded, affective practice, and my beloved Judy, not only with pain, but with immense doses of enjoyment. If we did not enjoy those technologies, we wouldn't be so addicted to them. My students go claustrophobic if they are in a place where they have no satellite signals. They go purple green and they just throw a fit. And the satellite signal is oxygen. If I am not covered, I ergo not zoom. I do not exist. Algorithmically mediated subjects as subjects of pleasure, as subjects of desire, as well as all the problems and the dispossessions connected um, to it. Do we agree? Can the left understand this? Can we have a um, common, fair um, political economy as opposed to the usual Luddite mistrust of the very technology that we are completely attached to? Then third convergence, the Anthropocene, uh, the terrestrial grounded earthed awareness of the continuum human non-human and again what else is new if you're coming from feminism from science technology studies from all of those areas saying forgive me a shield but that we have to reconsider the relation human non human all of us have been doing that you've been doing eminent work on that and forever why it becomes an issue now is an acceleration is a speeding up and a convergence of the, the phenomenon. And then I go again with Saranato. Supposing we strike a preliminary deal that we need to go beyond the anthropocentric gesture, which we can de define, the boundaries of which we can define. Suppose we do embrace Zoe, the non human condition. Where and how do we insert the social in it? How do feminist race class analysis intersect with? a non-anthropocentric position. How do we do that? Can we have non-anthropocentric social theory, Zoe-centered feminism, anti-racist, um, non-anthropocentric social theory, trans-species, Zoe, geo-techno-bound social theory? I don't want to sort of plead my own cause, but I think that's posthuman scholarship at its best. That's exactly what we are trying to track. And moreover, the front of nomadic theory from Deleuze to Glissant to Manuel de Landa has been in, 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 in inquiring precisely um, along this line. What kind of social theory do you do if you start from bees colonies? If you start from pre-modern non-Western social system? If you start from the digital commons? Um, so I think that we probably have more um, uh, resources there that we are aware of, but we do need, and here I endorse strongly 
again, as Shields plea, we do need a new alliances with what used to be, used to be the natural sciences, which have also disintegrated into sub-branches of technological applications. Let's call them the life sciences, but you know, even that is a misnomer. A new alliance, we need to look again um, and we need to reposition ourselves as not the soft, there's nothing soft about us, we are as sharp as nails. We are subtle, we are complex. Subtlety and complexity versus the hardness um, of these so-called sciences. Then the third axis and my conclusion, the implications for the university. A wealth of ideas, a wealth of notions and terminologies circulating in three overheated days. I start from my favorite, the post-university and the post-humanities. Uh, again, Sarah, Schill, a lot of us trying to go beyond some parameters of the traditional human, not nostalgic. But alongside it and without possible contradictions, humanities taking care of dehumanization, dispossessions and multiple vulnerabilities, solidarity and care, Athena, Butler's line, all of that. Planetary, but planetary as in earthed, grounded, anthropocenically bound to the conditions of their own survival. Haraway, indeed, Deleuze glissant nomadic thought, immanence, radically imminent, just a planet, not the A, we've only got one, and we sure made a mess of that one as well, A grounding for it. Um, digital artisan apprenticeship, the notion of the apprentice, how medieval, we're sitting in Bologna, um, where it all started in, according to some narratives, um, uh, the, the, the strong importance of Michel Serre, who was mentioned at least once on this, learning to be artisanal again. Um, and then why not? A revival of new humanist values, but neo-humanist values inserted into the algorithms, inserted into the machines. Um, the idea of moralizing the entire algorithmic culture, the line pushed successfully by Martha Nussbaum, uh, Marcia Sen, and many others, humanized the machines. Conclusions. The humanities, it seems to me, can only survive if they're willing to embrace the mutation, to change, to rethink the very grounds for their existence. We need courage and non-nostalgia, and of course, it's me speaking, so we need affirmative politics for troubled, overheated times. <laughs> I love it. This one wants me dead and this one slaps me around, but I'm happy. Um, I, 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 I want to say uh, first that um, uh, this was the, the, the first of the conferences of the International Consortium of Critical Theory programs, and I want to thank everyone here in Bologna, especially. Um, Rafael Lodani and um, all the people who work with him, um, Antonio and Michaela, at, I mean, unbelievable support. And I, I want also to thank um, Ramsey and Catherine from UC Berkeley who, who flew over here to make it all possible and who uh, took extremely good care of us. Um, we did not know, we didn't have a strong framing for this program. We weren't always sure what the exact question was, and but what was really impressive is that so many people flew across the world and presented work that was absolutely interesting, compelling, timely, and beautifully prepared. So um, what became clear to me was that the, there was an investment in the question, there was an, 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 an investment in the, the possibility of a conversation like this, and um, and it's, it's beautiful to be in Bologna with, with colleagues who are, um, are clearly left and in a town that has a beautiful socialist history. And, um, and, um, and this was really great. I do think um, that I will just say that we, um, we are left with cer certain unresolved tensions. Uh, 
what, what surprised me, what I did not expect, was that we would be debating calculation, computation, and metrics, digital humanities, to the degree uh, that we have. I know that some of us have a strong critique of technocracy. I know some of us are worried that algorithmic modes of accelerating labor actually should be stopped through strikes and other um, other uh, modes, and yet um, others of us want to be able to say that, look, many of these technologies, many of these metrics can also be used for other purposes, for experimentation that we value, and also for, um, for, for, for promise, for, for alliance, and for, um, and for um, uh, a, cr a, cr a creative understanding of critical theory itself. So um, I guess I just want to end by saying that um, you know we also had uh, a debate about whether critique was inside the institution, like is it a program, is it a practice that's contained by the institution, do we ask the institution to protect critique, or is critique something extra institutional, or does it cross that border? Does it actually have to cross that border constantly in order to have a critical function? Um, and. Uh, and just, you know, I will say um, that I think s student movements also cross the border between the university. They go in and out of the university. They go in and out of the seminar. Um, and, that, um, and that the current form is, as, as Ro Rosie says, digital, allied, embodied, trying to hold on to spaces of freedom, trying to repair and rectify histories of injustice, and seeking the space, the language, and the the possibility for um, greater equality and justice. So if critical is about anything, it's got to be about that. So thank you very much for coming.